and uh, what steps the police department has already taken before you can provide recommendations. I want you to understand what we're already, we're already working on. So if, if you don't mind, I'll have Officer Drody just give a, a, just a quick talk about the dog we actually purchased and, and why and, and kind of what we plan on doing with that dog. I think it's important for everybody to know. Hi, I'm Officer Drody. Uh, like Chief Glick said, I'm a canine handler. I've been on the force for five years. I've been a handler for four. I just started over as a trainer for our department uh, approximately almost a year now. So in the last process that we had, we were looking at trying to fill a void. We had a dog that's looking at being retired. We had a hole still from another dog that left that was retired before a handler left. And then we started getting talking into with uh, Chief Glick and Chief Parker about possibilities about looking at getting a gun, gun dog because of some of the prior situations that we had. Uh, so I did some research. Uh, the gentleman in the kennel that I go to that I get our dogs from, uh, spoke to them. They put out uh, hundreds of gun dogs already. So I got some information with them. We did some research. We decided that, hey, this is probably one of the best approaches to do. So we went ahead and quote unquote, pulled the trigger on. Okay. So we have a gun dog. Okay. So, <laughs> so the gun dog is going to be a pointer. Okay. It's not going to be an apprehension dog like our patrol dogs. Okay. This dog is going to be trained in person worn guns and then can also detect guns uh, on article searches and school lockers it can run vehicles now before anybody freaks out or anything gets up in arms it is southeast missouri okay everybody's allowed the right to have firearms so with that being said uh, myself corporal spencer who is going to be attached to the gun dog uh, we're both uh, constantly doing research because the gun dog is still fairly new especially to this area uh, about that incident. So like the vehicle aspect of it will be a very, very small area, uh, depending on most likely it's gonna be related to this, right? So if we have a shot fire incident and say our officers are able to find the car that is attached to it, we get stopped. If we need to, Spencer will be able to run the car, but again, it's gonna be on that one off scenario. More, more importantly, this gun dog is gonna be for SEMO for graduation, SEMO district fair. Uh, any event that the city puts on. So this dog will be able to walk and be in crowds. So anywhere that guns are not allowed to be at whatsoever, this dog will be able to walk into crowds. It's constantly working. It will alert. It will tell Corporal Spencer that, hey, this person has something on them that they're not supposed to have in relation to a firearm, right? And what it does is it just marks them. It marks them up and it just follows right behind them. There's no bites, there's no repercussions, there's no admin issues on chief side. And then Corporal Spencer will then handle it from there. And we'll pull that person aside, speak with them, and then we'll just go over there to find out what the policies are, especially with CMO or with the district fair, where the rules or the grounds are for there. Again, these are all areas that guns are not allowed to be in whatsoever. So that's that's our criteria that we're going off of, okay? Uh, the, I've already purchased it. It's doing a little bit of pre-training before I get it up at Shallow Creek Kennels in Pennsylvania. I should have the dog back within like four weeks along with my other two patrol dogs. Uh, training with me and the handler start uh, September 15th. They should be on the road by the middle of August or October. Anybody got any questions? You got all these kids? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so how many dogs Will you plan to have eventually? Will you have another gun dog eventually, or is this just going to be the only one? So this is the first one that we've had. Oh, okay. Completely at KPD. Okay, so again, gun dog. It's been around, but it's new to us in this area. So I'm gonna say this is going to be our, our like our test run with it. Gotcha. I don't see an issue with it. Again, but let's we're just gonna be honest. Funding and money wise, yeah. these dogs are very expensive. Fantastic tool. Okay, I'm biased because I am a hammer. Fantastic tool, <laughs> but they are expensive too. Right. Uh, but I could see us possibly down the road, maybe getting another one. Uh, just depends on the situation, the need for it, stats, see how well it does, and our events in the year coming up and whatnot. It's so, what made you decide to finally? Get a gun dog to work with, to, you know, to pair it with shot spotter and other things that we, you know, incidents or things that we've had in the past. And then, um, like the bigger events and things like that. So, what made you 
decide to go forward. Yeah. So again, everybody looks at it. It's a tool. Okay, but their noses, their olfactors are almost a million times stronger and better than ours. So we get a shot spot incident, right? Or like we have somebody, somebody runs, okay, and toss the gun. They can locate guns a lot easier than we can because it takes us digging through brush on our hands and knees right. sometimes, whatever. Uh, dogs, their noses, they can detect it a lot easier, a lot faster. They can cover a lot more ground. Uh, also helps that we have actually a drum program now that can actually do air uh, coverage as well. It kind of helps us in both aspects so we can work together. Okay. Um, shell cases, that's another thing what we got shot, shot spotted for too, right? Uh, this dog will be able to detect shell casings. Okay, so like we had a couple instances where we only found like one or two, even though we had like, like 12 that went off. Well, the dog will be able to help us locate more shell casings in the area. Yes, Dog discern between guns or shell casings and other metal objects. Yes, sir. Yeah. So it's all the it's part of the pre-training. It's a little bit above my pay grade right now because I'm still getting <laughs> getting into it. Uh, but John and the staff up there at Shell Criminals, they have more than enough training uh, experience and all the equipment to make that happen. And I just push everything off onto them. And then this question might be a giant question. Talk about events that um, have, have a prohibition on guns. Is that generally up to each organization to you know declare that, that it's a gun free event? Or uh, I know there's usually there's there's situations where um, different kinds of entities can. Right, and I think so. The one that I'm going off of most, and you might be able to speak on the more, uh, Seville District Fair. So like they have the signs posted. Um, I think it's between like we kind of lay the groundwork of what we're expecting whenever they come in, and then they uh, they have to kind of meet our requirements, uh, fencing parameters, whatnot, and then it's a it's a zero tolerance with guns. Like they do uh, checks or whatnot, but like it again, it's it's Missouri. You're allowed if you're you have a CCW, you're allowed to have a gun, but if you want to come in because it's technically a private event, private party. If you want to come in and partake in that, you cannot have a firearm. So like it's either we're turning people down, turning away at the go lock it up in your car, or like you're just not gonna participate in it. But like schools or <coughs> churches or school yeah. there are certain locations where guns are prohibited to be there. Right. Even with even if they have a concealed carry. Okay. So there are certain locations, you mentioned churches, uh polling places, that there are certain places where guns are prohibited. Okay. Places that are strictly prohibited by law, uh, that would be up to the business owner or whoever's running the event. So if it's not prohibited, uh, and the business owner prohibits guns themselves, then what we could do is, you know, that person can be asked to leave, and if they refuse to leave, then we're looking at a trespassing issue, but it's not an actual weapons violation. If they break the weapons law, they, they didn't follow the requirements to be established. Uh, now, I, I, later on, I, I believe we're going to have the prosecutor attorney come in and talk about the actual statutes regarding gun laws. That was a question from last meeting. Uh, so the prosecutor attorney, he is on schedule to talk. Uh, I, I don't know if Nicolette's here. She's probably uh, there. You go. Uh, what, what is he coming in to speak? Do you know? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Okay. Yes, and, and I spoke with him last week, so he's willing to, to kind of go over those gun laws, and I, I think that's more appropriate coming from him. Uh, so all that will be covered. Just we're, we're not going to get too deep today. Uh, but you know, anytime we're talking about any constitutional issues, we want to make sure we're doing the right look, and that's why uh, I, I think Officer Grody is, is doing the best job he can. Yeah, so, will community organizations who are having public events will they be able to request the presence of the dog? Absolutely. I, I, I mean, that's a, more of a his question. Uh, once our training's done, I don't see why not. I think more exposure the better. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, we, you know, we have a lot of gun shows here. So, will that now be allowed? At that, will he be able to be there as well, even though it's a gun show, or probably? So it probably could, and so I, that's actually a really good question because I haven't even like gotten that far in, in oh. thinking about it. Uh, but honestly, yeah, just for the fact of security, right? right. right. But more or less, honestly, you're, you're looking at almost overwhelming the dog for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in that aspect, you'd almost be better off if like if a uh, patrol dog would be better off there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
but again, like then we're working, we're worried about liability, right? Because yeah. our dogs are trained in fighting. So like that's kind of a gray area that we'll have to figure yeah. out. Uh, and but something that me and Chief will have to talk about a little bit more. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No. Yes, sir. So can you clarify the next time? The dog is extended out the metal. The dog is extended out the gun. So it's not so much the gunpowder residue. So it's, it's the actual gun itself. Gun itself, it'll uh, be uh, some gun, gun uh, powder as in like the residue portion of it, but like the guns itself. So like the, the metal slide, our glocks and polymer handles that we train the, the polymer handles on glocks, uh, rifles, uh, any type of revolvers, gun metal, uh, anything with that aspect. And then also holsters too. You said this is a pretty new training in general, right? <coughs> so case law with us in Missouri, yes. So like you go on West Coast or East Coast, and then it's a little bit more predominant. Okay. Uh, so the kennel that we get the dogs from, uh, whenever I went up there this past uh, Monday to talk and talk to John at Test Dogs, uh, he actually has three that are currently over in the Olympics right now. Oh, wow. security <laughs> runs. And that's just gun dogs. He has two other patrol dogs that are over there. Yeah. Well. And to answer your question, Jared, I'm not aware of any agencies, at least in this area, that no. so we would be setting a precedent. Yeah. And again, so that's why like it's it's been tough because like we're constantly having to like, I've got, uh, so there's a gentleman that's out of Chicago. He's a former canine handler. He's now um, pretty much what we call like a canine guru yeah. for the most. He covers case law across the United States. Yeah. He puts on seminars constantly. He's coming into O'Fallon, but like whenever we start talking about the gun dog, I need to call him and I was like, hey, I need everything I can get gun dog related. And most of her right now is federal based. And like, that's kind of what we're going to have to start basing our stuff off of until we get it here. And then we talk with Prosecutor uh, Mark Welker and kind of understand our, our route that we're going to have to take with everything. Right. So like, we're kind of like, we're a little advanced, we're jumping ahead because of the situation we got going on. We kind of want to add this tool in the help with everything that's going on. But again, right now we just have, we don't have a lot at our level state-wise here. Yeah. Uh, so we're having to go and look at everything federally for the most part. Uh, on the uh, Kate County Fair thing, and, you know, the scenario of you know, the, the dog finds a gun, you say, hey, this needs to go back to the vehicle type thing. Is there any kind of process where you naturally run an ID, check for warrants, whatever, that kind of thing, when you run across somebody with a gun in a restricted area? So at that point right there, all we're doing is make sure that guns aren't coming into the fair. We're not, I'm not, unless I absolutely like know that person by <laughs> face. Probably some of it too. And then I'm like, yeah, I actually know it. Like they're, they have something, I'm literally just turning them away saying, hey, do you want to partake in this event? Just go turn it, put your gun away. Yeah, and then there's a lot of just moments like questions. Yeah, are they engaged in suspicious activity? Yeah, yeah. Reason to get something. Somebody they know you're looking for type thing. Correct. Or if they had a firearm that you suspected stolen. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, just it's every situation depends. It just dictates what's what's going to happen. Any other questions? Thank you very much. I think it's a very exciting opportunity for people. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. You're free to stick around, Brody, but if you need to, he, he has training with, with some more canines he's got to get to. Yes, All right, so if uh, everybody's good with it, we'll move on to the shot spotter presentation. Uh, you know, this got asked last time, does shot spotter deter or prevent gun violence? This technology and flock as well, by itself does not stop gun violence. It, it's not, that's not gonna happen. But it is an important piece of the puzzle when we're talking about putting a gun prevention program together. And uh, I think uh, these gentlemen here are going to kind of hit on that. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the shot spotter team. And I'll, I'll let you guys make your introductions. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Alfred Lewers. Um, before I go any further, please allow me to introduce our team. Uh, we have Kevin Johnson. Kevin Johnson with Sound Thinking, formerly known as Shot Spotter. Been with the company over four years now. Prior to us, I spent 30 years with the Chicago Police Department, I retired as a deputy chief with the department, in charge of community policing, our training academy, and I helped on board Shot Spotter back in Chicago back in 2018. And good morning, my name is Jeff Cakel. I'm a county executive for this region, this territory. I spent 26 years in the Marine Corps, and then upon returning from the Marine Corps, I uh, got hired on with this amazing company to help, uh, again, get this technology to cities like yours. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
And if you'd like any additional information at the end of the presentation, there will be a QR code with their LinkedIn uh, information, uh, just in case you just want to learn and see some of the things that they may have published. And again, I'm Alfred Lures, Senior Director of Trauma Response and Community Engagement with Sound Thinking. I'm going to piggytail pigtail off of the story, uh, the, the information that we got earlier uh, related to dogs. So this is this wasn't even in my presentation, but it is of critical importance that um, you enhance the utilization of these tools uh, through whatever methods necessary. So one of the key components of um, gun crime intelligence center strategies is being able to collect shell casings and link them to other crime scenes. Believe it or not, you have a better chance of making a connection on a crime gun in a non-blood shooting scenario than an actual blood shooting. So you have a shot spot or alert, you respond to a location, you search for shell casings and locating those shell casings, um, that may be a scenario where somebody was just test firing a gun. Four months later, they use that gun to shoot up a house or to commit a homicide. Now you can tie it back to a different location. And uh, this is an incident where uh, we had the, uh, one of our customers contact ATF to have their gun dog come out. It was a shot spotter alert with two rounds on a Saturday. Uh, he came out on Monday morning. Zane Dodds is the ATF agent. Uh, his dog is Babs and he found 514 shell casings. It was a repeat gunfire location. It was overgrown, hard for the officers to locate it. So that's how gun dogs can assist in investigations and shot spotter alerts. So not tied to my presentation, but I just wanted to share that aspect of it. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through this presentation. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them. Um, we like really tough questions um because we think it's very important that you have information and in our opinion the most uh the best aspect of community engagement is sharing information so very simple uh agenda today uh we're going to talk about shots about sound thinking our company uh, i want to give you a better understanding of shot spotter i'm going to talk about shot spotter success um, share information on analysis, metrics, and output. Uh, share information with you on uh, the privacy audit assessments from a couple of years ago. Uh, talk about the second phase of your shot spotter deployment uh, beyond gunshot detection. And then uh, talk about opportunities for collaboration in serving communities. And of course, at the end, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them at that time. So. Um, first thing I want to do is uh, I want to share with you about our company. So our company is uh, Sound Thinking, formerly ShotSpotter. Uh, so uh, over the last several years, uh, we've had an evolution, and I am always having an issue with trying to pause this. Hopefully this pauses for me. Yes, it did. Um, so we've acquired several different companies and technologies over the last several years. So our marquee product is our shot spotter gunshot detection system. We've been around for our gunshot detection for over 28 years. We have over 36 patents. We're in 170 cities across uh, the United States. We're in the US Virgin Islands, Bahamas, Uruguay, South Africa. Uh, we have a 98% retention rate for our customers. Uh, and um, most of our customers within the last five years have actually expanded their coverage areas. We have our safe point, which is our um, uh, AI assisted weapons and explosives detection system. And then of course we have our crime tracer. We like to call it kind of like it's the Google for law enforcement to be able to search billions of pieces of data and put together a, a better picture for investigations. And then we have our case builder. It's a case management solution. Uh, and then there's a subsection of that. It's case builder gun crime. It's our uh, gun crime uh, 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 management tool. And then we have resource router. Resource router is our patrol management solution. 
uh, gets an aggregate of data and it uh, lets the police know where their resources and their personnel should be, uh, as well as community resources. So that's just the story of, of, of our company, Sound Thinking. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to play this video on ShotSpotter uh, and uh, to give you a better understanding of how it works. You know the fear, gunfire in your neighborhood, but you don't know where it came from. Is it close? Did someone already call 911? Are my family and friends okay? Is there a victim bleeding out? In the event of a shooting, a minute could be the difference between life or death, a life or death situation in your neighborhood. With ShotSpotter, law enforcement agencies are notified within a minute of gunfire deploying police officers and other first responders to the exact location of the shooting. Their rapid response saves lives and disrupts the gun violence cycle. ShotSpotter's gunshot detection technology starts with acoustic sensors positioned on top of buildings or street lamps. If gunfire is heard in the coverage area, the sensors will detect and timestamp the sound. The precise location is determined by analyzing the time it takes for the sound to travel to each sensor, effectively triangulating the sound. A possible gunshot is analyzed by an actual person in the incident review center. From there, they determine crucial information. Is it a single shooter or multiple? But most importantly, is it actually gunfire? Or is it a firework or a car backfiring? If it is gunfire, an alert is sent within 60 seconds to law enforcement. This is crucial, as over 80% of gunfire goes unreported. When gunfire goes unreported, lives are lost and gun violence becomes normalized. I do know that in fact there were several lives saved and one actually in our community due to shot spotter. A man was shot on our streets and no one had alerted police to the shots being fired. Therefore, the police showed up and the man was not responsive. So they administered CPR to this man and saved his life. He's alive today because of shot spotter. There are many reasons why gunfire can go unreported. Sometimes community members are not sure if what they heard was gunfire. Perhaps they think someone else will call. Or maybe it's so common that they're desensitized to it. And in some cases, they're simply scared of retaliation. ShotSpotter enables a rapid, consistent, and precise response that can save lives. We had 732 shootings uh, last year, and the majority of those were picked up by ShotSpotter, which means that we're able to respond quicker. The quicker we can respond, the higher probability there exists that we're going to save a life. The precise location information provided by ShotSpotter helps investigators collect evidence and, most importantly, shell casings. Evidence that can solve crimes and take dangerous criminals off the streets. There's just a bunch of data that says that, you know, crime has gone down the community, and I really attribute that to uh, having ShotSpotter in the community. Improving the police community relationship begins with transparency. ShotSpotter's reporting capabilities on response time and ground truth, such as evidence collection, improve police accountability and transparency. That transparency builds trust. Trust that your police department will respond to an emergency as fast as possible. ShotSpotter's gunshot detection system is currently used by more than 150 cities. With ShotSpotter having been deployed in Greenville for a year now, we've seen significant reductions in overall gunshot and gunshot wounds within the city of Greenville. This technology stands to make your life safer, to make your family and your friends safer. And the mainline story is a community feeling super positive about the police department that forever never showed up when there were incidents of gunfire that now are showing up and they're showing up quickly, precisely, and respectfully because they want to serve that community. ShotSpotter is committed to building trust between the police and the community. In the moment of crisis, do you want to worry if the police are responding? Learn more at soundthinking.com. So it's important to note uh, that uh, 
every technology, I don't care if it's diagnostic technology, imaging technology for cancer screening, um, there's certain levels of false negatives or false positives. I'll share with you that uh, our technology, our contractual obligation and our promise is that we will provide 90% of the audible outdoor non-suppressed gunfire within 60 seconds or less. Uh, so um, that is what we um, guarantee with our technology. So no technology is uh, but we're constantly monitoring our level of accuracy and we depend on the police department to let us know uh, when there may be either a missed incident, a mislocated incident, or a misclassified incident um, so that we can um, do proximate cause analysis, try to determine uh, what's gone on, what has happened, why we've missed that incident. Important to note that there will be some times where we will miss incidents and we can't tell you the reason why, uh, but most of the time we can, and we are uh, well within our service level agreement above 90% here in Cape Girardeau. So. Uh, another thing that people ask about is success. Um, uh, it is important to note <laughs> Gun violence is a very complicated problem. Uh, there are no b magic bullets. No one can tell you that any piece of technology or strategy is going to be responsible for giving you the level of success in redu reducing gun violence that your city deserves. Uh, but we can share with you that ShotSpotter is a linchpin technology, uh, and it is very valuable when you put in place a very holistic approach to addressing gun violence. And I wanna compliment uh, the chief and the entire department for the level of professionalism and the commitment that they've showed in employing best practices related to initial response, dispatch, analysis, and the utilization of our tools for investigation. So they're doing very well here in Cape Girardeau, and uh, we appreciate the professionalism that they put into it. Kevin Johnson being your customer success director, uh, he can give you the guidance related to the best practices, strategies, and policy development and implementation, but it's the leadership of the agency and the professionalism of the agencies within the department uh, that will determine the overall outcome uh, with, uh, with ShotSpot. I don't give out a lot of praise easily. I don't, I just don't. I will tell you, the Cape Girardeau Police Department is a model for the entire country. What they've done with their deployment, other cities are trying to emulate that. So we wanna thank the mayor, we wanna thank people at Cape Girardeau, we wanna thank the Police Department, Cape Girardeau, their commitment, the moment they onboarded, leveraging technology, working with us, communicating, doing data analytics, all the right things. I just want to give, just give your flowers while you're here. So thank you very much. And what you're seeing today, this is a part of one of the things that we actually talk about at Sound Thinking, the ultimate, well, you know, community, well, really the ultimate community engagement as far as I'm concerned is responding to a shot spot alert, having an individual first aid kit and rendering aid and saving a life. That's the ultimate community engagement. But uh, uh, something that's very important is sharing information with the community, identifying stakeholders, and this is what is being done today, and we're thankful to be here for that. So if you're interested in success, this is a QR code. You can shoot it, and you can go to our site, and it's got information on uh, different uh, levels of success at different agencies across the country. We depend on our customers to tell us about their successes as well as any challenges that present themselves. So this QR code, uh, and we'll make this uh, certain parts of this uh, presentation available in a PDF and you can and shoot it. But this is right on our website uh, and you can see the different uh, stories, text, uh, testimonials and the success case uh, studies related to ShotSpotter. But more importantly, you are interested in the, the uh, success in Cape Girardeau. So we were so pleased that we were able to do a, uh, a, a success case story uh, here in Cape Girardeau. And this was after your first year. So after your first year, uh, you'd seized over a, a 
a dozen firearms. Um, several of those, uh, there were no 911 incidents that went along with it. Um, and uh, at this point in your first year, you had recovered over 300 shell casings. So over a period of time, uh, that's going to increase even more. And uh, tracking these shell casings to other crimes that occur in other places uh, is key to success. I share with people that as far as I'm concerned, uh, shell casings are the rape kits of the 90s. So if you know anything about that, there's scenarios where there were kits that were sitting in evidence rooms and there were assailants. DNA was on file and they were quite, sometimes they were actually incarcerated after they committed a crime. But because those, those kits weren't tested, those, that DNA wasn't harvested and compared, they were on a minor charge and they got out and they were able to reoffend. Same thing with shell casings. You could have a scenario where these shell casings would tie a gun to a crime and you could have someone that could be stopped on a minor offense, um, uh, aggravated battery shooting at somebody and that person may not even want to, uh, uh, to prosecute. But that gun and the shell casings that go along with that incident could be tied to an unsolved homicide. So collecting and testing those shell casings of, is of critical importance. And first thing you have to do is collect them. So, um, so we're going to go over some of the analysis, the metrics, and the output. Very important to always establish what your goals and your priorities are. Uh, with that, have a plan in place and then identify what your actual metrics are that you are going to measure on that journey to make adjustments to either improve your process uh, or, or to even replicate it in other places. So of course, you know the city's 29 and a quarter square miles. Your shot spotter, your population is uh, right about 40,000 uh, people and your current shot spotter coverage area is 2.68 square miles. Uh, when you went live, you went live with a shot spotter coverage area of 1.2 square miles in April of 2022. And then on May uh, of 2024, you had an expansion of 1.48 square miles. So that gives you your 2.68 square miles. So those are some of the numbers. And um, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, it says May, May, May the 24th of 2023. Thank you, Chief. <laughs> so uh, uh, th th those are the numbers. And what is often used to determine coverage area is the historical gun crimes and the shot spotter data. So that's what's historically used to identify where to put coverage at. So, so when looking at annual gunfire, but as you look at this information, recognize that we're unable to compare apples to apples in this scenario because there has been an expansion. But this just gives you information on the number of shot spotter alerts over the last few years. In 2022, you had 156 shot spotter alerts where 568 rounds were fired. And keep in mind, that's not a full year. In 2023, uh, you had 418 uh, shot spotter alerts where 1,494 uh, rounds were fired. And again, keep in mind that there is an expansion in here. So you can't equally compare to see if there's an increase or decrease. And so far, uh, uh, as of July the 29th, 2024, uh, you've had 200 shot spotter alerts with 685 rounds being fired. Um, if you look at the trend, it looks like there's a, a, a decrease. So. Yes, Madam Mayor. Because we now have mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I appreciate, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to downplay anything, but I also think you, you're apples to apples. Um, right. Yeah. So that's one thing that you made a good point. 
So when you take a public health approach, one of the most important aspects of it is looking at the data. The data that you had before ShotSpot was not comprehensive because we know that you're getting less than 20% of the gunfire information called in. Uh, this is accurate, uh, we say to the tune of about 90%. And it gives you information on where um, neurobiological harm is being done to children, youth, and their family that are just simply exposed to chronic gunfire. So this gives you a different approach. This gives you an opportunity with your limited resources to put those resources in place, not just from a law enforcement standpoint, and we're gonna talk about it later on, the second phase of your shot spotter deployment for a community-based approach to try to get to the root causes of what's causing that gunfire. And in reality, it is a responsibility that is outside of the responsibility of the police department. There are other organizations that have shared responsibility that don't know where they should be. ShotSpotter helps them to know where they are. Yes, ma'am, you have a question? I did. Um, I just want to know, like, as far as, like, data and stuff like that, how often do you, um, like, research the data and look at the data and apply it to the use of the ShotSpotter? That you are asking that correctly. And one of the things I can share with you that the police department uses that data, um, we give them, they have access to insight. So at any time they can go into insight and they can see a temporal grid. They know the days of the weeks and the hours of the day of gunfire location. They can specify a search criteria. I say, I wanna see the time of day and the date of week the time of day and the day of the week gunfire activity over the last 30, 60, 90 days or over the last year. Uh, they can also see repeat gunfire locations at any time within the police department. So they can do that at any time, but we do believe that the second phase is bringing other uh, folks in to, uh, to also use that data. Great question. Yes, sir. I don't have that answer. That's something that the mayor and the chief will have to answer when that time comes. <laughs> so, when we first implemented the program uh, back in 2022, and, and I think this question was asked last time, why did we decide to put it in the area that we did? So we looked at our current stats to see where gunfire was happening, and we, we wanted to focus on those particular hot spots where those gun crimes were happening. We wanted to cover that area first. Once we were able to branch out in 2023, uh, we looked at the second highest locations. We wanted to cover that area. If we are able to expand, we would look at the third highest areas that aren't currently being covered. We want to cover as much of the city as we can uh, to, to make sure we're covering these, these gun shops. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the chief had mentioned at the council, I, I think the area we were kind of looking at next was going to be that North Broadway location uh, in, in that particular ward. But, that's going to require money, that's going to require you know, funding, and, and there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle that we have to figure out first. Uh, if, if it were completely solely up to me, I would like to expand it, but it's not completely up to me. So, good question, didn't mean to hijack your presentation. No, I need to answer. Is this for me or yes? Mm -hmm. There's, there's um, upfront costs in getting the technology here, and then there's annual subscription. That is correct. Mm -hmm. so that has to be, but I, then those such a question is um, with, with this help in, in, in additional places. So I have a question in the back, but before I answer that question, I'm going to share with you some scenarios. The city of Miami has 93% of their historical gun crimes and shots fired areas covered at 14 and a half square miles. They currently have the lowest homicide rate in the city of Miami since 1964. Um, I've sat in on their comp stat meetings and of the 27 cases that they bought up, 25 of them were shot spotter related calls. Uh, they also have a crime gun intelligence center strategy in place, uh, and they got federal funding for it. Uh, I didn't share with you, I'm a retired assistant chief of police in Miami Gardens, Florida. We deployed Shotspotter in 2012, 
in the time I was in Miami Gardens, I was able to assist the getting about four to $5 million in grant funding. Uh, some of that was urban area security initiative funding. Some of it was uh, safe cities initiatives. Uh, so one thing that is important to note, if you can demonstrate um, the need and you have a story related to how you want to reduce risk factors and improve protective factors against gun violence, uh, and e the funding is there, um, whether it's federal funding or whether it is through private philanthropical organizations, hospital districts, the funding is there. You've got to tell a compelling story and you need the data. Um, so, yes, ma'am. Can you compare Kate Gerardo's, this average of one event per day, like, like in, in a per capita way, to other states in the United States? Because I know I'm unable to do that right now. We used to do a gunfire index. We no longer do that, but I can't say for sure. Yeah, and I'm sorry, sir, you had a question in the back. So one of the things that we share with people is you don't pay for infrastructure. You're not paying for sensors. So like how uh, sometimes people would like to know how many cameras or how many automated license plate readers. With ShotSpotter, it's just like kind of like AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon, you pay for coverage. So you are getting coverage for a specific area of 2.68 square miles. However many sensors we need to put in that area in order to be able to detect 90% of the outdoor gunfires, what we put in place. Yes, sir. We do. We have project managers who manage all aspects of that, and we have a team that's uh, monitoring the systems at all time. Mm -hmm. And just because a sensor goes out doesn't mean that it impacts the coverage area. We uh, overbuild our, our coverage areas to, to, for redundancy. Yes, sir. You mentioned a lot about funding, grants, and other things. Do you, uh, do you have any examples of public private partnerships? in a city have come together to expand coverage? Or, sure. Uh, that kind of Greenville, North Carolina is one that I can think of. Uh, you saw the, uh, the trauma surgeon there. The hospital district actually covered uh, a part of the shot spotter coverage. There's several others and, um, you, you know, Jeff would be able to assist with that information on, on different uh, examples of uh, those private public public private partnerships. Have we explored that at all from the council Stuff we have reached out to and I don't want to put anybody on blast, but we have reached out to certain institutions that we have been successful in getting a partnership with anybody thus far. But, but it is something we're actually considering they seem to have a model for it. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to share with you, so sometimes people say ShotSpotter is expensive. Absolutely not. ShotSpotter, if you have a gun violence problem, in my opinion, it is the most relevant piece of technology that you should have in your city. And I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, a homicide costs society minimum of about 827000 to $1.5 million per homicide. And that's from the Giffords Center. And that's taking into consideration the initial response of police, the investigation of police, EMS, if that person makes it to the hospital, the prosecution, the defense, uh, incarceration, lost revenue from the person who has been murdered, lost revenue of the person who's incorporated, reduced tax revenue from depressed tax values because of crime. So, Gun violence and homicides are very expensive. And if you, and it's, it, it may not be, it, it's coming out of a bucket. It may not come out of the police department, but it is very expensive. And if you can use tools to reduce your gun crime and your murders, it is, in my opinion, worth every dime. We're not even talking about the, as we said, the, the harm that is done to people who are exposed to gunfire on a regular basis. Let me put it into perspective and I will make it perfectly clear. 
ShotSpotter was only a part of it, but when we deployed ShotSpotter in 2012, in December of 2012 in Miami Gardens, we had 27 homicides that year. City of Miami Gardens, 20 square miles, 110,000 is the population. So that's a lot of homicides. Uh, in 2020, 2013, we had 25 homicides. 2014, we had 18 homicides. In 2015, we had 14 homicides. So if you start doing the math, and again, it's shot spotter in conjunction with a holistic approach, all of those things contributed to the reduction in gun violence in our city. So, yes, ma'am. I just looked at everset.org, which is what Moms Demand access every time we're going to take for our data. Mm -hmm. And from a Missouri, um, and at an average cost of $2,875 per resident per year, Missouri has the highest, seventh highest per resident cost of gun violence in the US. Yeah. And that's the statistics are there. It is worthwhile. And I offer that if you use technology like this, along with the strategies that are proven, Thomas App's book, Bleeding Out, if you haven't had an opportunity to read that book, read that book. It, it's got a great plan on, on how you can address gun violence, but it is, it's a strategy that you have to have in place. You got to have leadership. You got to be committed to it. And you have to care before it hits home. So that's what happens in these scenarios, in, in, in our opinion. So this is just the monthly gunfire trend that you see. And I'm so I'm sorry, I may be behind schedule. Um, this shows you the red is the number of rounds that were fired. The blue is the alert data. Uh, and then, of course, these are some of the numbers that matter. Um, since your shot spotter deployment, 13 victims have been located. And, and it's very important to note that the shot spotter is giving you this information most of the time in less than 60 seconds. Your 911 calls uh, are much, uh, takes much longer if you even get them. And shot spotter is more accurate. It gives you a 25 meter halo of where that gunfire event occurs as opposed to someone calling in and saying uh, it happened over on Mayberry and Adams Street, and it could really be a quarter of a mile away. 74 buildings or vehicles were hit in shot spotter alerts. 32 arrests were made. Uh, not all of these are gun related arrests. Uh, 31 guns were recovered. And uh, up until July the 29th, 982 shell casings were recovered. So those are just some of the numbers. So I, I, I'm, I'm not going to speak specifically for the department, but I'm going to talk about a crime gun intelligence center strategy. So a gun crime strategy says that shell guns are going to be uh, tested. They'll be fired. When they fire that gun, they have that shell casing. That shell casing is then uh, put through a NIBIN system, a national ballistic system, to see if there are leads to other gun crimes whether it occurred here or whether it happened in St. Louis or whether it occurred in Chicago. It is a national database that's managed by the ATF and they can determine that though that crime gun, and that's what they call it, it was a gun that was used in a crime was used someplace else. Um, all, it, all they have to do is test. It's not that difficult, but it just has to be done, so. And specifically to answer your question, we do use Tyler. We also use e trace too, which is mm -hmm. also for the EPF that tracks the purchase and the history of each firearm that we recover. So both those systems, we do put the firearms and ballistic information in there to be tracked. And then, and then you test every firearm that is recovered. Yes, we, we put it through that e trace system. Every, mm -hmm. every firearm. Yep. Yeah, that's that's great. And we, and we have a great working relationship with the ATF. Uh, you know, one of the individuals stationed on a cape is a former cape officer uh, that used to. And there's no situation where 
wouldn't have the resources to be able to perform the test and, to, and to fill out the, the data, whatever that is, in the system. On that side of it, no, like every gun recovered and every case recovered, we put through the system. And it's not a, that part of it is not a resource that should be already in the When it says recovered, does that mean the gun was left at the scene? Or in some cases, does it, that it mean either it left or we find a suspect yeah. that has the gun on Another thing our system uh, will do, it will give you uh, fully automatic gunfire. So we can tell you whether it's a multiple shooter scenario in, in certain situations, we can tell you that it's a moving shooter giving you direction of travel and speed and something from a situational awareness standpoint that is of critical importance is whether somebody is firing a fully automatic weapon. Uh, it could be a deadly scenario for the public and the responding police. So uh, this is just a list of uh, some of the alerts that represent incidents that were tagged as being fully automatic gunfire events. And these are the different locations. But this is what it really sounds like. I'm gonna play it again. That is a full automatic gunfire event. So what you're looking at right now is this is a, uh, this is a shot cast. So um, for media purposes, if there's a, a, a crime situation where there's a shot spot alert that leads you to a scene, you can produce these uh, um, shot casts and share information, whether it's for your, uh, your social media or your broadcast media or your online media. This is what you're looking at right now. And this is from an incident uh, in the 200. Well, this is a, this is a, is this, is there an independence here? Yeah. So 200 block of Independence Street. This was from Sunday, June the 16th, 2024 at 1.38 a.m. This is an actual incident. So that's what that looks like. Yeah. So yes, and we'll uh, it it actually uh, it'll actually show you like an animation. It'll show you the the progression of the shooting. If somebody we have scenarios where it's a drive-by shooting, somebody's shooting at a house. Uh, they go down to the end of the block. They turn around and they drive back, and they're shooting the other direction at the house. So yes, that's what Shot Spotter can provide to your officers. It's invaluable information for trying to locate. Because we can look at that that replay. And whether or not it is a mobile shooting like you discussed. So then we know, okay, obviously a car is involved and a lot different than a person. That's okay. That's okay. I don't know if you have an example you're going to play, but it actually shows on the map where the shots are happening. And it'll track it in order. So if you have a progression, it'll actually track it in order to see yeah. where it's going. Yeah. So it's, this, it's, this, every, it's the same principle. So you're using time and distance. So the time and the distance of an event, uh, each of them is going to have an individual longitude and latitude. So one round will be fired here. The next one will be fired here. So it will actually show that it is a moving shooter in the, sh in the gunfire event. Hmm? I'm not sure if you, you guys From a public standpoint, people want uh, to make sure that our technology is uh, protecting their, their privacy. Um, so we actually had an audit done by New York University's uh, Privacy Commission. And what they actually, uh, I'm sorry, the, the policing project, and what they did is they looked at how we operated as a company. At the time when they looked at us, we would have 70 hours of spool time and uh, we would give our customers four seconds of audio at the beginning of a shooting event, the gunfire event, and then two seconds of audio afterwards on the shot spotter alert. They made a suggestion, made several suggestions, some of them that we take our spool time down to 30 hours and that we give one second of audio before the gunfire event, the gunfire event, and then one second after the gunfire event. We, uh, we adopted all of their recommendations and the purpose of that was to 
make sure that there was a less likelihood of of acoustic surveillance with our technology. And this has the information, you have the QR code there and you can, you can read the report and get other information related to it. So we take it very serious, people's privacy. Uh, our technology is outdoor, uh, above the ambient noise of a city, uh, and it has less likelihood of uh, picking up uh, of uh, voices. Yes, Madam Mayor. That's your ordinance. At all. Mm -hmm. So everything you're talking about, anything picked up, is, is illegal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I mean, I appreciate the privacy, but I appreciate the privacy issue, but just to be clear. Yep. 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 Firing of a gun is against I think it is one of the most serious things that can occur in a city uh, because it has the potential of taking lives. Yep. And if you want to go hunting or you want to go to the range, go hunting or go to the range, but guns shouldn't be fired in cities. So I agree with you 100%, Madam Mayor. <laughs> so. Beyond gunshot detection. So what we want to talk about now, this is basically, this is your phase two of your shot spotter deployment. So we've talked about how well shot spotter has been used by uh, the department. And um, we actually believe that um, as I said earlier, having that public health approach to addressing gun violence, it takes a lot of people to be involved in this. Um, looking at that data and saying you have repeat gunfire locations at these locations and having a strategy in place, having that holistic approach, that public health approach of looking at that data, um, whether it's an office of violence prevention in neighborhoods of safety. And if you don't have one today, you may, if you need one, the creation of one. And it doesn't have to be specific to the city. It could be county. It could be surrounding jurisdictions. A school-based handle with care program, being able to provide information to them on kids who've been exposed to gunfire based upon where they live. Um, uh, or if it's a hospital-based uh, uh, violence prevention program, I mentioned to you earlier that Greenville hospital system has paid for shot spotter. A lot of people don't realize that if you're, in, if you're a part of a lifestyle where violence, unfortunately, is a part of the things that you contend with, uh, it's often hard to get people to get the help that they need. Uh, when they have been the victim of a a shooting event, a gunfire event, a violent crime, that's when they're most apt to accept that care uh, and that, uh, that help that they need. Having a hospital-based hospital approach and that organization in place is helpful. Whether you have a city uh, services, city and county victim services, Department of Public Health, or federally qualified health center outreach program as a part of what we call our Data for Good program, all of these organizations, individuals, and even a university research partner to look at your shot spotter data to bring resources to bear, we think that that's phase two of your deployment. And we're available to assist with that. I actually uh, I'm the Senior Director of Trauma Response and Community Engagement at Sound Thinking, and we'll assist you with planning that out and uh, trying to, to help your community along those lines. And then, of course, uh, opportunities for uh, uh, collaboration and engagement. Another thing that we think is important, and we've had helped several of our customers with, um, like we call them City Connect events, it's basically you're taking that shot spotter data, you're determining the locations that have the repeat gunfire, and then you're bringing resources to those specific area, whether it's a Saturday morning event where you have, you know, your static display, your police department, you have your public works there, uh, you have your parks and recreation, they're looking, making sure that the street lights are taken care of, 
any other infrastructure issues that exist, having job services present, having psychological services present. Uh, and many of these organizations, if not all of them, are already in place. So there's no additional cost associated with it. They already have the responsibility to do these things. But what you're actually doing is you're bringing them to a specific location that has been adversely impacted by gunfire. We believe that it's important to do that. Uh, we'd be happy to partner with you to be present. Uh, and, you know, you, you, prob you have probably got great resources and don't need our assistance. But if you need our assistance, we're willing to assist you with that. So we believe that that is uh, the second phase of your shot spotter deployment, that collaboration and engagement. I gave you a lot of information. I really appreciate your time. I'm sorry. I think I may have gone over. Uh, I think we've answered the questions, but are there any questions that you'd like to ask at this point? Yes, ma'am. Um, so mm -hmm. So have you ever had that um, on like college campuses because mm -hmm. of mass shootings that occur mm -hmm. on college campuses? So what is that success rate for shot spotter on those college campuses if you implemented them? There or not. We had a lot of universities. We're at Hampton University, we're University of Maryland, Savannah College of Arts and Design. So we're in a lot a lot of different universities. And quite often some of our our universities are some of our most low volume customers. So they have very few gunfire events. But when there is a gunfire event, it's of critical importance that they have precision and know where to go. Um, and in some of our university customers actually use the shot spotter data so that when the chancellor contacts the police chief, he can say, yes, we received the shot spotter alert, but it's actually three blocks away off of the campus. So uh, that's how our tools are used uh, at universities. Yeah. I mean, as a student, the class, we start So going to class and Buildings are like from, from here to there, mm -hmm. to there to, you know, mm -hmm. so just for, you know, as a precaution. And quite often, gunfire events and mass shooting scenarios start outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, there's Kevin's QR code if you'd like it. Uh, and then, of course, Jeff's QR code is there and mine. And like I shared with you, we're going to make this available uh, for you in a PDF. And again, thank you for your time today. Thank you. All right, bye -bye. So that's all I have on the police end of it, uh, unless anyone has any other specific questions. Uh, otherwise, I'll turn it over to whoever's. If there is anything that I can do to help or answer questions. Uh, I'll say this. I know uh, Adam, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you have questions about some of that NIBRS data from the last time and seeing what the actual gun crimes look at from that NIBRS data. So, you know, and this is something I had to educate myself about. When we take a report and we submit that report and it gets approved, that gets sent off to NIBRS. Actually, it gets funneled to the state first and then it gets sent off to NIBRS. Uh, and that's done on an individual basis by report. So we don't get that aggregate data on the back end. We might see the, the NIBRS report that's issued later, but as far as pulling out the information from that NIBRS data, that, that's pretty difficult for us to do. Uh, we're trying to figure out ways to do that. Uh, we actually had a contact with the state. Uh, we work through the CJIS department, which is the Criminal Justice Information System, and that's who tracks. So I mentioned NIBRS, but there's a MIBRS system which is Missouri. Missouri. Yeah, so it actually goes through the Missouri side of the curve, and then it goes to the federal side of it. Yeah. So my, my point is trying to get that information. It might sound simple to us when we're talking about it, but actually diving into the system and pulling it out, that, that's it, It's not a matter of keystrokes and being able to produce a report. A lot of times it does require hours and hours to pour through individual reports. And the other thing to understand about NIBRS data is that on the output side, which is what she's talking about, we input the data. The output side is the public side. You can go in and get information. Anybody can go in there and get information. It may not match what you see from the police department, and the reason is because they treat the data differently based on what type of crime it is. 
So if it is a crime against person, they're going to count uh, individual victims. If it's a crime against property, they're going to count instances. So <clears throat> where UCR data, which is the data that we used to use up until March in 2020, only counted the most serious offense. So you had somebody that shot somebody, kidnapped somebody at the same time, ran from police, ran over a cop, um, and committed, let's say, four other felonies during that time. UCR would only collect the most serious offense. The system that we use now with NIBRS is going to capture all of those. So it's more robust data. And that's, again, another important thing for you to understand if you're looking for past data is we switched in March of 2020 from UCR to NIBRS. You can't compare the two. It's not apples to apples under those circumstances. So when you're requesting data, depending on what it is, like homicides were the same under UCR as they are under NIBRS. Uh, robberies, some of the top offenses are, but again, if you had a homicide where there was a kidnapping and they shot a couple of other people, UCR is only going to capture that homicide. So. You bring up a question or a, uh, yeah, a question that probably you can, but you can, but when talking about sponsoring um, or scholarships, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. uh, people attending the do we do that again? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, we, that's something we started. Uh, oh, Bobby, it's been a few years now. It's multiple uh, years that, that, that CAPE has been doing that, yeah. Uh, can, can you talk, both of you probably have perspective on this, but the challenges of hiring and retaining um, officers? And, and, and basically, your budget has X number of officers, right? You have some vacancies, probably. Can you yes. speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me tackle the second part of that question first as far as vacancy. So yeah, there is money being saved because we don't have all those positions filled, but then at the same time, we're having to spend overtime to try to cover that work that has to be done. Yeah. So, you it's know, it, it's, yeah, we're still, even though we haven't filled those positions, we are still paying in, in overtime costs. Uh, it's a lot times more expensive than actually hiring somebody out, right? Uh, as far as, uh, you know, trying to attract people, when I first started, I want to say there was probably 80 to 90 people in my hiring process. So I was competing with all the others, all these other people to get hired. Um, and, you know, it was a long drawn out process and it was very competitive. Now we're having hiring processes where one, maybe two people show up. So that has completely changed. Um, and for the most part, uh, none of those people have been through an academy yet, so they're not post licensed. So that means we have to pay for the academy on the one or two applicants that we're getting. And for the record, so I deal with the departments on a daily basis basis throughout the state, but I also deal with departments all across the country. I've got a, a Bethel, Alaska recruits out of our academy. So I'm talking to people all over the country. Um, it's not a problem that's unique to Cape. So understand that. That's true. Um, uh, yeah, and to give you an example, I was in Lee Summit yesterday, and I talked to the Kansas City officer. At one point, they were at 50% of the staffing level. So over half of the department they didn't have. Now they got it back up to about seventy percent, but they are down a lot of people right now in Kansas City. Yeah, um, Wayne County, Michigan, which is Detroit, they were thirty percent staffing. Okay. So. So the folks that you're getting, do they have, like have they, is, do they have bachelor's degrees? Like, nope. So well, some of them do, some of them don't. Yeah, it depends, but for the most part. Yeah, and that's you know I I work for the college. Do you need a bachelor's degree to be a police officer? No. Can it enhance your your career uh, opportunities? Yes. So, um, I, so, and I'll say this: so most of the people that are going through college, because I've been through a lot of career fairs, I, I go to the CMOS career fair, you know, twice a year. Yeah. At least I go to other career fairs too. The college students that, that I get that I talk to are not interested in being a police officer. They they have desires to either go federal or they want to go into you know like cybersecurity or, or one of those other fields. Uh, most of them do not have a desire to be a police officer. In fact, I can't think of a single person I've talked to at the college campus that wanted to be a police officer. Yeah, and I, I, the, barrier, I, the barriers um, to recruiting uh, um, people that want to become officers, not, not trying to convince people that don't want to become an officer, to become, the barriers to recruiting, um, uh, some, some of it is probably lifestyle, Especially if you're, if you're 50 percent um, vacancy and you're filling in, filling in the, the, the gaps with overtime, that's hard on your person's life. 
and their family. But Black Harvest lifestyle, it's, I mean, it's financial still an, an, an item? That, that is still an item, yes. Underpaid? Yes. It, Relative and, to the risk? Well, not only that, but, but if you look at just statistics in this area, and you look at calls for service, for example, uh, you've got like KPD's calls for service compared to, you know, not to throw anybody out specifically, but Jackson, for instance. There's a pretty big difference between the number of calls that we're taking on a daily basis compared to a city like Jackson, or a city like Scott City, or even Sykin, or even the Sheriff's Office. Our call for service outsh outshine those other agencies by and large. Like seven to eight times in some instances. Just so you understand, we're talking yeah, City of Cape. It's not even close. We're doing forty thousand to sixty thousand calls per calls for service every year. But you staff based upon that ratio, right? Theoretically. Yeah, we, we, we try to. You build know the yeah. staff budget based upon that ratio. Yes, yeah, we do. What is an industry uh, best practice? Right. Yeah. Ratio. It right. is, but then being understaffed is the And I get that. So, so, and it's, I guess it's a flywheel that just doesn't stop. Well, yeah, yeah, but then if we're talking about pay, so, you know, if, if the pay is equal to these other agencies, yeah. or less, yeah. but you're doing seven times or eight times the yeah. amount of work, yeah. you know, that, that's difficult to attract people to our department. And it's also the type of crimes that we're responding to. As you know, the reason you're here is because we have a lot of shootings. There's a lot of gun violence right now. Yeah. Okay, you don't have to, you're not, you work at Jackson, though, you're not responding to those kinds of calls. You're working at, at any of the local sheriff's departments, you're not responding to those kind of calls on near the volume that Cape Cod Police Department is responding to those calls. So that not only the type of, of not, it's not only the pay, but the, also the type of law enforcement That's a good point. that we're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and then, higher it's higher risk. It's higher risk. risk. High stress. Yeah. And stress. I mean, I, I, I get all those things, and I agree with that. Um, so you're seeing the same nationwide same kind of discussion. Yes. And from a pay perspective, what are um, what are communities trying to do? What are they what are they doing to try and overcome that hurdle? Uh, pay more than their neighbors. That's what a lot of communities are doing. Um, you look at you know um, just I so I've been with the university for 13 years. Um, when I started, Sykeston was at 24000 a year. Um, they are over 50000 right now. Uh, Jefferson County, just three years or four years ago, was at about 50000 They're up to $70,000. Uh, St. Genevieve has been at 70000 for a while, but when their neighbor, St. Gen, or uh, Jefferson County, um, got their big increase, they're looking at increasing now as well. So. It's a lot of competitiveness between departments, but then you also have to look at from a police officer's perspective, and I'm, I'm not talking about KPD, I'm talking about from a police officer, because I've literally trained 90% of the police officers in Southeast Missouri. You're looking at uh, what, other, what other opportunities does that department have for me? What can I, what, not only what is the job there, but what are some of the, the things that I can do? Because I'm gonna be honest with you, you become a cop, it's fun, we love doing it, and I've enjoyed every bit of it. You start getting older, the swing shifts, that hurts. It starts, it starts to become painful. Going out and answering calls on a daily basis becomes painful. We, as police officers, we want some other place within that department where we can go. We want to be, maybe become a detective or maybe work uh, traffic or, or some of these other things. So. When you're looking at it from a police officer's perspective, they're looking at not only the pay, but what opportunities are there um, at that department. Um, and they're also gonna be looking at community support. You know, you've got St. Louis County um, and St. Louis City had prosecutors run on prosecuting more police officers. Fine if they're doing criminal stuff, because there's nobody that hates a dirty cop more than a good cop, and, and prosecute all of them. And, and I'll be right there with you. Um, but when your goal is to prosecute cops, that's why St. Louis City is still under 50% um, capacity right now. So, Chief, just to kind of put you on the spot, do you get the necessary financial support from your budget? Well, it depends on what we're talking about. We have for hiring, for hiring, or, or, uh, uh, police, police officers. We have to be competitive. Yeah that pay has to be equivalent to the work that we're doing. And right now you can get paid either equal or more at an agency where you're not doing here as much work. So I, I think that the pay does need to be right. 
So that that, that is an issue. Gotcha. And, and, I'm not, I'm, this is not, I'm not being critical of the city, no, but, but pay, yeah, pay, pay, pay is an issue, not just with the police officers, but our dispatchers, with our jailers, uh, the other positions as well. Well, and here's something where I'm going to, and I, I'm just, I'm going to praise Glick here for a second, because a lot of these specialty and secondary positions at the department, when, especially back in 2020, when things were really bad with COVID and everything else, were taken away from the department by the former administration mm -hmm. and were never put back. Chiefs are already trying to work to get those things back. So officers have hope. They've got something that they can look forward to. Love being a cop. I don't want to be a cop for, you know, I don't want to work the street. When I say being a cop, I don't want to necessarily work the street my entire life. And some of the first things he's doing is, is getting some of those specialty positions back in place. When you come in as a young patrolman, you look and you say, oh, hey, look, I do have the opportunity now to, to go to a different division, to go to traffic or to go to become a detective or, you know, uh, a canine unit or, or something along those lines. Chief, as always, I, I think you're actually mentioning some of the dynamic shifts that happened. You both remember where people would be here for decades. Yeah. And then there were massive exodus. Right. Which might be helpful for the task force to hear what some of those dynamics have been, were, and how they have continued and, and why we need to look at it a little I mean, again, I started in 93. For me, there was a massive shift after Ferguson, um, 2014, 2015. Um, that's when we really started seeing um, support eroded for law enforcement. And I'm going to be honest with you, um, and, and sometimes this isn't a popular thing. People don't necessarily like to hear, but there was some shady stuff going on in some of those police departments up there. And I don't know necessarily that Ferguson would have went the way that it did had the police department had the trust of the community. One of the first things I teach students on day one of the academy, treat people the way you want to be treated, okay? It doesn't matter what they did, you've got to treat people the way that you want to be treated. And if the community does not trust you, you cannot serve them, okay? So one of the things that is a dynamic shift is, at least from my perspective, going back 30 years, <clears throat> is community outreach. I'm a big community policing uh, one of the things I believe in, I've seen it work. I know it works. I know Chief is as well. And that's having your officers getting out there and being a part of the community and doing things in the community, uh, such as this. Um, but, but coffee the with the is, Yeah, you, you look at calls for service and with less staffing, if our officers are responding to those calls for service and taking those reports, it does translate into less time in the community that we would like them to spend. Absolutely. And that's the unfortunate part of it. So I think you said it's just a never-ending cycle, and yep. that's what's happening. Uh, my last question on budget, and you won't have to deal with it. Uh, <laughs> so how many how many officers are you down? I believe it's fourteen currently. When you say you're down, that's based on allocated FTE. Yes. Yes. So you know, to me, that that only becomes an I struggle with that a little bit, right? Because I I'll be honest, I can put in my budget ten positions. And never fill five of them and say I'm always at 50 percent staff. Um, you know, to me, that's probably a more critical question: is what is statistically our ideal number and size of force activity? What have we been operating with, and where are we at by comparison? Because I mean, if we've been operating at 10 percent below for two decades, and we're still at 10 percent below. I would argue you're really at full staff. I, you know, if historically that's the number we've always been at. That's really full staff. Whether or not you're allocated additional budget dollars or not, we probably need to analyze how we allocate the budget. Yeah, that's fair. And that also depends on what you want your officers to do. If you want your officers to be involved in the community, then you're not full staff. You know, if you want them going from call to call to call, getting burned out, leaving to go to work for other departments, they're going to work, they're going to work less and make more money. You're not fully staffed. But, but to me, that's that catch one too, right? Because mm -hmm. we want to demand for more money, but we also want more officers. So. Mm -hmm. If, if we're if we're leaving dollars on the table every year because we've budgeted for positions that we know we're never going to fill, but we're also not giving you raises because we can't do that delta across the FTE schedule, what's our first, what, I, I would argue, what's our first priority? Is our first priority to fill the 10 or 14 positions gap, that or is the first priority to add more dollars onto current pay staff? I, I would say those are related. I mean, honestly, when you add the dollars, you're going to get the staff. You're more likely to get the staff. And you're more likely to retain people. And then you're more likely to retain people. But, I mean, I understand I, I understand what you're saying. Right. Right. That's, right. 
right? Yeah. If, that's also like me saying, I want you to answer every call, but also do community questions. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and again, I understand. That's not, that's not a fair expectation. I, and, I, and I do. I understand what you're saying. And you're right. I mean, that is, and it's a legitimate question. If you've been operating like this for this long, are you full staff? And, and the reason I say no, and I'm, I'm speaking strictly from a, a, a law enforcement training perspective, not as the chief, not as a member of the police department, is that if you are wanting your department to do all these other things, you have to get up to full staff. You've got to figure out what you have to do to get to that. I don't think you, you, you can say uh, at this point, when you look at the turnover, and this is with any department, you look at the turnover um, versus what you have those officers doing, you have to take that into account. So again, my, my perspective only. And where your turnover is. What's that? Where, where your turnover is. If your turnover is at the bottom part of the triangle, your, your organization with your new folks, whereas the Turnover leadership positions that the, you know, kind of the, yeah, it's you know what I mean? Where, where is your turnover? It's, it's all at the bottom, and maybe the scale needs to be great. So, so lately, it's been both. And you know, there are issues we can address internally, uh, but you know, I'll say with the people that are leaving quickly, uh, there, there are a lot of things you can put up with with more pay. And, and, and there is no perfect police department out there. So, I, I think. You know, even talking to officers at other departments, I've heard criticism of other departments, but it always comes down to, but they pay more strong. You know, sure. So that, I, I think that's kind of what you're getting at. Uh, but there are things we can do internally to tighten up on that. That's what we're currently working on now. Uh, enough. Let me just one option. Yeah. Right. I guess how many do we have? Or how many we have? Probably. What's our FTE for some Yeah, it, it's, it's 70, and, and don't quote me, but I, I want to say it's around 72. Now, again, like the patrol positions are going to be the primary positions that we have. Sure. That, which are, that, that is a, an essential function of the police department. But in order to make sure we're fully staffed in the patrol division, some of those extra divisions we have to take people from. So our repetitive division is not fully staffed. We have our traffic division. You know, and we have these other divisions that we're not able to staff because we have to have people in that patrol. So at 1,400, you're saying like roughly currently, <coughs> we're saying about 58 sworn officers on staff. That, that sounds about right. 72. Give, and give, I know those are exactly And, and keep in mind that those, yeah. it's not that there's, there, people are working overtime to cover those sure. positions. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like that we're just operating right. with less people. We're, we're taking the people that we have. And again, it's not just a cape. I know you're concerned about cape. <clears throat> My point is, in all of this, is none of these problems are unique to you, okay? <clears throat> but those, those, those staffing levels are being maintained by working overtime and, and, and bringing officers in to work overtime. Okay. Uh, well, it's, so just kind of getting back to the core question of either uh, prevention or enforcement of gun violence here. Mm -hmm. um, sounds like what you're saying is, uh, I mean, we've been, so been told many times the work's getting done. The enforcement side is getting done. Yeah. And certainly, you know, we look at the response of, of especially kind of higher profile things. Which, you know, it looks exemplary. Um, but it's getting done through a lot of extra uh, work. It, it is. Um, and, and yeah, there are a lot more resources. The, so. He's speaking to the, also to the, to the point of not having folks engaged in perhaps some community prevention type of things that, that might be appropriate for the police department to be engaged in. Is that I, I agree, yeah, and I would much rather prevent a crime from happening than have to deal with it after the fact. And that, that's always the goal. Uh, but again, some of those things are difficult to do when you're short on staff sure. because we still have to respond to those crimes that have been committed. So I would like to get to where we can focus more on prevention than what we're currently doing. And I don't know if you mentioned this already, but for the first time in history, we haven't had anyone in the can of academy for us. Well, we've got, we got, we got two. Yeah, yeah I, I was able to find a couple people last minute and get, get them in there. So. And when you say last minute, what was that struggle? Because this is, I mean, making history that we didn't just have people just wanting to come in. No, and, and you know, it is, some of that's a little misleading because we did have applications come through. But some of those applications get weaned out because they're not qualified to be police officers. They, they don't meet the minimum requirements. They might have a felony on their record, or they might not have a valid driver's license. I'll take it back. Qualified. Yeah. So that, that's that's the issue. That, that, that's the issue that we're. 
And, and we do a lengthy background on people just to make sure that we're hiring the right people. We, we don't want to. We don't want the wrong person to fall through the cracks, and then we have a much bigger problem with work. So we do lengthy backgrounds on everybody, uh, and you know, out of that system, we were able to get two people, and, and some of those were just me reaching out to people and saying, "Hey, I heard a rumor you were looking at being a police officer," and, and we, we were able to go from there. But you know, without those personal contacts, we would not have had these two people in the police academy. And can you give the perspective? 20 years ago, you came in and those things. How many? So again, yeah. <coughs> when, when I went through, I mean, I, there, there were. Uh, we, so we used, we had to, we couldn't use a room in the police department because there wasn't enough room to test everybody. We actually had to go out to the old safe center, and we actually filled up one of those auditoriums with applicants. And if you had to give it a guesstimate, how many was that? What's that? If you had to give it a, a guesstimate of candidates, how many was that? That was between 80 and 90 when I went through. And now you're never going to qualify. Right, and those were from different processes. Yeah. So when we when we put it, when we do a hiring process, by hiring process, that's when we do the physical fitness test and the interview. Yeah. Um, you know, we may get maybe five or six applications come in, and out of those applications, maybe you know, two or three of them meet the minimum requirements, and then when we invite them to come, maybe only one person will show up. So that that's what we're actually seeing on a regular basis. Another example is '96. I applied for the Highway Patrol. There were 5,000 applicants statewide. <clears throat> two years ago, there were 300 statewide. So. <clears throat> so if the uh, we well, first of all we only have like five minutes left. But if the if the if the colleges are not producing candidates for you, is there is there get something in place or is there an opportunity to put something in place with like CTC? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we are working with the CTC. I didn't mean to yeah. jump in, Bobby. But uh, as CTC in high school. So I, I've, I've been to the last two career fairs at Cape Central High School, um, <clears throat> and we're working on getting out to Jackson. Uh, one of my other officers went to a career fair at Kelly High School, so we are trying to branch out with the high schools. And in CTC, I've been out to career fairs with them. Uh, they have a mock interview day, so we'll have some of our officers go out there and help them out with the mock interviews. Uh, there is an actual criminal justice program at the CTC now who is run by one of our part-time officers. So he's been really good about you know, looking for potential applicants and letting us know about it and us reaching out to them. Uh, the problem with the high school part of it is to be a police officer, you have to be 21 years old. And when they're in high school, they're not 21 yet. Uh, but we do have other positions. Yeah, we have a gap, but we do have other positions like jailer, or dispatcher, or nuisance abatement officer. We do have other positions that, you know, if, if the person running that program at CTC thinks that this might be a good person, uh, we'll contact them and, and go through the motions there. And we, we have had hired, we have hired several good candidates from that. Our most recent police officer hired, that's how we got him, it was through the CTC program. Um, and then he went to the jail, and then once he turned 21, we put him to the academy. So that, that's our most recent police officer. So that's what we're trying to because I actually sit on the CTC board for the criminal justice department. And one of the things that we're trying to do is um, <clears throat> exactly what Chief said. We're trying to, to get a pipeline. Yeah. If you're if you're you graduate from high school and you want to be a police officer and you want to go to college, boom, you got a criminal justice degree. But a lot of people don't. So what are you going to do? Yeah. I'm working with um, <clears throat> CTC in we're going to put a 40 hour jail program together where anybody that's wanting to possibly go into law enforcement doesn't want to go to college, they can take this 40-hour jail officer program or dispatch program or communicator program. The law enforcement academy will give them a certificate that they can then take to the local police department and say, hey, I got a little bit of training. I want to be a police officer. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to work in one of these positions. And we're trying to get this pipeline flowing uh, of those types of candidates and then that gives the police departments the ability to look at this person bring them in they're uh, serving an essential function but it also gives us or them the chance to look at them for three to four years and then whenever they're 21 then right. they, they will sponsor that's them to the academy years of age, that's a state requirement it's not a case requirement. Right. yeah i just had a quick question before we close so you know you know a lot of times police officers work in other parts of the country and they may get in trouble for whatever reason and then they get gotten rid of, fired, terminated, whatever. So has that ever been a case for Cape Girardeau where you've gotten an individual that was a police officer, say, in Chicago and they, you know, police brutality or something like that? How did you weed them out or how, I mean, do you accept them because we need the police officer or do, or do they even 
have an opportunity, a chance and heck to even, you know, work with you guys. So no, that, that's a good question. So that's why it's absolutely critical to do a full background investigation on every single Okay. And if we do have somebody that, that has you know, something like that that they've been in trouble for, then they're not going to be eligible for hire with our scanners. They won't even get in the academy. So I screen people very thorough. Okay. Um, already. <clears throat> Great yeah. Great yep. Then they come into the middle of the department where they start asking people in the Yeah, so you're talking about a lateral. Um, I, I don't. doesn't have a funky background, that's what it sounds like. Right, yeah. So just a couple things to consider. I don't know of any specific examples where we've done laterals at our agency. I know the city has in other departments. Police department, I can't think of any example to do that. We have to be careful on how we do that, though, because if we do bring somebody into the middle, then the other people. You know, I, I don't want them to be jaded because now they feel like they haven't had a chance to promote because we're looking at outside before we're looking at our own people. You have to be careful how we do that. Uh, it's not something I'm opposed to, it's just we have to be careful. I don't know, is, but, uh, and I'm not sure how Jermaine this is, but at least I'll ask it. Is the police, uh, is the King Gerardo Police Department unionized? So, not, it's not technically a union, but there, there is a fraternal border police. Uh, it's not affiliated directly with the city. They are their own organization. And they perform what on behalf of the officers that belong? Does everybody belong? No. 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 It's, by, it's by choice. By choice. Yep. And they do what on behalf of the officers? So I can't speak for the FOP. You know, that, that would be a question for them. Uh, they do have regular meetings. And uh, you know, a big reason why people are joining up for the FOP is for legal representation. But they don't, they don't actually meet with you on some regular basis or so advocate, the, advocate for So them. Chief Blair was meeting with the FOP on a regular basis and just, just having discussions. But as far as making promises or you know, making deals, it, it was more just a lot of communication. Yeah. That's why he was meeting with them. Yeah. Uh, they have no bargaining power under a union right. type so not, structure. Yeah, it's not technically a union. Right. Okay. <clears throat> well, Boom, my yeah. pop. Um, let's do that. Thank you very much for your time today. And task force members, thank you for your time. Thanks for sticking with us till 9. And uh, our next meeting is August 15th at 7 a.m. right here.